what is going on everybody hope you are having a wonderful weekend um it's not weekend it's the week hope you're having a wonderful week whatever day of the week you're listening to anyway let's move on to the podcast this week uh i have a guy called ed carney on ed is a man of many talents however um i know him mostly through running the management company grade management uh grade is and was the one of the most influential management companies in underground dance music over the last 10 years managed so many artists from seth Troxler, eats everything uh groove armada the list literally just goes on and on and on go check them out um but ed during covid has kind of moved on to a lot of other things as well um a lot of tech and a lot of other things and we spoke about this on the com- on on the podcast it was a really really good conversation um really interesting for aspiring artists really interesting for current artists um so make sure you keep it locked without further ado ed carney and we're live ed how's it going mate very well thank you well nice to see you mate yeah you too you too it's been a while how's uh how's wonderful england right now it is uh as it has been for most of the summer Rainy. Gray and overcast and slightly gloomy. Um, it has been the most depressing summer on record, especially compared to last year, which was absolutely dreamy. Yeah, last year um, we were lucky, work, right? Weren't we? It was just like COVID, I mean, COVID hit and it was the best summer we've ever had. Everyone went on holiday in their yeah. back gardens. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. It was great. Drinking gin and tonics and kind of clapping with you soon for for the free, for the free money. Yeah. Um but um yeah it was uh yeah it was a, a very uh, s- sadly those of us in the dance music when the dance music industry when were not we were kind of nose to the grindstone kind of worrying about existential crisis but um most people were just in the back garden drinking beers and uh and yeah not doing very much for most of the summer. This summer has been a uh, completely different kettle of fish. Uh it's been grim and grey. Um, and it's so typical of us as two Brits to start a podcast like this talking about the weather. <laughs> probably move on to I guess the good thing that. is, is that we're raving again in the UK. Have you been, to, have you been to any? Have you been to any I parties? Have. What's it it's like? Been, it's been absolutely amazing. It's, it's been, it's like being, you know, re- reacquainted with your, 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 you know, your kind of higher self in a lot of respects. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, it's been uh, both at festivals. I've been to three festivals now of very differing sizes. Um, and um, those were really magical just to be in outdoors and, you know, in nature with your friends and, you know, the, all of the kind of, you know, sights and sounds of the fair. Yeah. Uh, but then actually I've had, you know, two nights out in Bristol. I kind of kept, I kept going out to, um, to nightclubs a bit at arm's length. Everyone was like kind of rushing into them, but mm. I didn't want to get sick. And I kind of, I knew they were there and I just wanted to pick the ones that I went, you know, went to carefully. Yeah. So I went to Fabric up in London, which was magical. They've had yeah, a whole, but... during COVID, they've had a whole refit and um, oh, really? they've got some new, so a, a new investor who's really, is a really great guy, um, you know, sort of goes to Burning Man and mm. uh, really kind of approachable fellow. And he's spent a lot of money on, on the club over um, over lockdown. I think Fabric's one of the really good examples of, a, of an institution that's benefited very well from from COVID in a lot of respects. Yeah. They've, you know, I think when something's been going as long as Fabric or, you know, there's, there's various other kind of, you know, sort of well-known brands in electronic music, you can easily take them for granted and um people do and then you know you have new venues opening like printworks or you know whatever in london and um you know very quickly people just start yeah start to take fabric for granted because they you know it's always been there and oh you know it'll always be there or that's what people think in their heads and then something like cover comes along it's like suddenly you're denied that yeah and it makes you take us take a pause and you know and actually kind of think about shit i'm you know i I miss this thing and how special it is um, so it's an absolute pleasure to go back there and they spent so much money on it and they've, they've had a really, I mean, Andy and Judy and the whole team there have had such a, a, a kind of solid, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of lockdown period where they've really kept plugging away. They've done loads of amazing live streams from cool venues around London and it was just so refreshing to see the venue kind of, um, you know, open and in, you know, it, it, Re- reinvigorated Fresh. really yeah, yeah. um yeah. i think i think it's really important that, that venues do that generally generally like there's there's so many there's so many clubs around the world 
festivals around the world that just stay the same. And I think that's when I, it's the same with artists, right? I don't know, like you've managed lots of artists in the past, but it's like, I think if an artist just carries on doing the same thing over and over and over again, it kind of gets boring and people kind of get a bit bored of it. And you you have to evolve. We're in the artist communities and ev evolution is so key. Yeah. I think, again, coronavirus has been very, very kind to a lot of artists. I agree. Um, you know, um, it's helped uh, me out massively. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you you you've you've played an absolute masterclass through it. Of how, as far as kind of you know building in in some respects, you know, it couldn't come come at a better time. Totally. You know, it's slightly morbid, but you know, you've just done your you know your your big you know US tour, mm. you know, and show you know showcasing the label for the first time, and then it's quite hard to repeat that like three yeah. months down yeah. the line six months down the line a year down the line and get the same amount of excitement yeah um but you know you've kept your powder really dry and you know spent the the whole of covid you know making amazing tracks and really building your streaming numbers and building the kind of interest on both sides of the atlantic and um you know so you know you come out of this you know in in a very much improved place than than you went into it yeah i totally I agree and for a lot of big artists as well a lot of you know mm. um you know, I was chatting to Matteo from Tale of Us the other day. I'm yeah. you know, working with a lot at the moment, and he was saying that, um, you know, it's been it's been really good for him. You know, to take a bit of a break, get off the the merry-go-round for a, mm. for a minute. He's worked on a he's done an amazing solo album. He's um, you know started a whole he started a whole new company doing some very kind of forward-thinking endeavors in the in the kind of like um, in the art world. Um, he has, uh, you know, had a time chance to kind of, you know, to, to, you know, to relax and reflect. And now things are back on, you know, all guns blazing, even better than they were before. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's and that's that, you know, that's great. Um, I think, you know, I think there's 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 numerous artists I can think of who have benefited from from this period. What I am interested though is to see actually what once thing once the sort of the initial jubilation of the whole reopenings on both sides of the Atlantic, um, uh, you know, have, have, you know, kind of simmered down a bit and, you know, we're back to more of a status quo. What does that status quo actually look like? Because there's a whole generation of, of youth of, 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 you know, young people who have come of age during this period. Yeah. If you're like, you know, if you were 17 years old, when the pandemic struck, you are probably not set foot in a nightclub until, the last couple of weeks yeah you know um and so do you want to go and listen to what all of the older kids were listening to two, two years ago or do you want yeah. something completely new i think and if, i think this is know, what, if so what does that look like yeah and that's and quite I, exciting i think that's what's kind of been really interesting as well for me to watch during covid is that you've there's been quite a few artists that have kind of come out of the woodworks due to streaming yeah. and personally like streaming wasn't for me like I mean, doing like live sets and things like that on Twitch and YouTube and whatever, Instagram live. It, it wasn't for me. It's not what I wanted to do. And I didn't do a single live set. But there's been a lot of new artists that have kind of really built a core following and a core fan base that would those people would never have seen them in a club because they weren't old enough. Um, and, and you've kind of built this really big following due to your personality online and it's more so about the personality and who you are rather than the music you make or play if that makes sense yeah i think it's i think there's it's um it's an interesting one there's there's definitely this this last 18 months has been it's almost been like a kind of ex exercise of scarcity mm. you know if you like strip back what you've the, the tools that you've got at your disposal for you know engaging audiences and 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 you know and self-promotion and you know touching reaching new new fans and you know and, and 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 sharing your music with people and a huge part of that is done on the dance floor at festivals nightclubs you know and everything in between yeah and you're left you know with much less you know at your disposal to reach for what do you then do with it mm, yeah i mean some amazing examples of people who have really innovated you know it could be live streaming it could be in interesting ways of releasing music it could be like think pieces or just what they've been doing on instagram you know some people yeah. have had you know they've kept their kind of flame alive just by really interesting engaging funny you know commentary on the the you know the whole you know sort of madness of the situation i think know? tiktok and i think i think in the next 
year, we're probably going to see a lot of TikTok DJs. And I know that sounds a bit strange, but I think there's going to be a lot of people that have got very big on TikTok over the last 18 months that people are going to be booking. Well, I know there's, I, I've got friends that are doing it at this moment in time where they, they were ex- they were nobody before COVID. They got big on TikTok and now they're playing shows. They're going to be headlining festivals in the next couple of years. Yeah. yeah. And that's because that's where the zeitgeist is right now. Yeah. You know, um, and, uh, you know, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine earlier who was another music manager who was saying that he was, you know, thinking about moving on from, you know, from he's in not, not so much in the electronic music world and more mm. in, the, in the kind of, you know, the pop, the pop world, moving on from some of his artists simply because they absolutely, you know, they're above 25 years old and they just hands down refuse to engage with TikTok. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a medium that I'm particularly enthusiastic about. I think, I, I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty sort of, um, uh, <laughs> I'm not a great fan of social media full stop. Yeah. I'm more, more into kind of immediacy. Although I do totally, you know, I can't at the same time as a, as a, as a, as a music manager, not um, completely uh, see the, you know, the, the use and appeal of social media and all of its various forms, you know, be it TikTok or, yeah. you know, um, even some of the more niche ones like Snapchat um uh you know they all have their their place in in the world and you know tiktok's just an amazingly vibrant platform yeah you know well I, mean? I i think get, going back to that like from you working with seth and eats like back in the day i remember like when they were on the up their social media was just blowing up and what yeah you- i mean we were very lucky that we um we really sort of started our journey in music management just as the sort of facebook fan page was yeah you know, being actively promoted as a, as a, you know, as a, a you know, a thing that Facebook really wanted to kind mm. of, you know, drive traffic through. Um, over time, that was kind of left by the wayside as Facebook tried to get, you know, more, you know, uh, a bit more greedy with advertising. I mean, yeah. you know, really, you know, this the kind of organic viral engage, virality and engagement that we used to be able to get on 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 posts. You know, just funny, well yeah. thought through posts you know, you were getting up to like 80% of someone's, you know, of, yeah. of, of someone's fan base on certain posts, you know, sometimes up to a hundred, if you really smashed it. And on a couple of occasions, I remember we one had, you know, we had one with, you know, something like 13 million likes or something, just completely, you know, a uh, funny Wolf of Wall Street one. Um, and, um, you know, that was, that was very much of a time. And we just, we were very lucky to, to, you know, to be around that time where you could really engage. And it was, you know, it was fan engagement. Yeah. 101, you know, you put cool content, funny content on that, you know, people were into, into liking, you got people's attention, you know? Um, and um, so, you know, we were very, very lucky, you know, to have been around at that time. And then obviously Instagram came along and, you know, we had to kind of, you know, to, you know, wrap our heads around that. And that's now, you know that one of the sort of the, the main main tools for you know for, for self promotion and you know soon uh, right now being superseded by TikTok, and yeah. it's like it's, it's it's like anything though. It's like as a music manager, as a an adult, as a parent or whatever, you reach these milestones. As it was an artist, you can reach these milestones in your life where a technology comes along, whatever it is. Mm where you just go, well, I'm not down with it. I don't get that. That's, yeah. not, that's not for me. Yeah. At that point you've lost. Yeah. You, at that point you are no longer relevant. Mm. You know, that moment where it's like, you know, uh, my parents would just never, not to say my parents had lost, but then my parents would never engage with social media. They're just yeah. not, they're not of that era. And that's that point where they've just gone. That's not for me anymore. You know, um, and, um, you know, um, and so, you know, one of the things I've always, really tried to do as a you know as much as a parent as a, as you know as someone in the music industry is stay current and stay mm. up to date on you know why people are using technologies what are driving you know and it's as much about tiktok as it is about fortnite and minecraft yeah you know um you know why uh for example you know me bit nfts are going to do hugely well in the future because all of the current there's a, the decision makers of one generation on totally are currently playing minecraft yeah mm. so they're all 13 14 12 whatever yeah. 10 years time they'll be getting smart jobs in in DeFi and yield yeah. farming and what have you um and 
they will be the ones that will be like, okay, I want something that's retrospective and nostalgic for my childhood. Yeah. So I'm going to go remove it. I, I, guess, um, I guess the thing that I kind of question about it all is where does the music part of it fit into it? Into what? Into the social media the and everything like that. Because cause a classic example is like you're posting funny stuff on social media to get a lot of engagement right you're you're geek and that's what that's really that's what you're one fo- of the things that pisses me off about social media actually is the fact that you know music posts really don't get the kind of exactly. you know the, the algorithm doesn't get behind them yeah. in a way i mean the, th- the thing about instagram instagram is very much does what it says on the tin it is it's it's an instantaneous you're supposed to show what you are doing now yeah and it really promotes you so you need to have your face in it for starters for the algorithm to actually really bother with you too much yeah um unless you've got something that's you know so so, you know sort of tear-jerkingly funny or like um Mm. you know uh naturally kind of you know uh uh you know organically viral that you know people are just gonna you know grab it and run with it um so it's not really supposed it's supposed to be picked for pick for for posting pictures of yourself doing things you know you and your friends doing things that's the whole point of it yeah Right, the people have decided to hijack it for self-promotion. I'm just going to shut the door in case the ravaging hordes of my two small children come home. <laughs> um, currently shut in their bedroom because it's the only place I can be guaranteed some privacy in the <laughs> house. But um, um, but uh, yeah, I think that you know that the, the musicians have decided to hijack Instagram for their own, you know, for their own purposes. And so um, I think you know we shouldn't feel too kind of you know upset if they're not really going to be you know sort of. Uh, over promoting pictures of spinning records on decks and what have you. Um, yeah, you have to give you have to give something to what their what your followers want realistically, and it's yeah. just it's just always amazes me though because it feels like you have to do certain things, and I, I'm I don't have an issue with it personally because I I like social media, I, I get what it's about, but I think coming from it from like an out outsider's point of view, you're like we're we're people follow us for the music but they don't actually necessarily want to engage on the music they want to engage on uh interesting posts or something like that that's the yes. thing that i this that kind of baffles me sometimes don't get yeah. me wrong if you're think, good if you're good at it, it i have to be said, said though that, that you know that the focus um covid has put the focus so much more heavily onto social media whereas really social media would be the thing that gets people kind of energized about going out and seeing you play yeah. you know play your play your records out live live and um so uh that's you know that's uh you know uh been it has been quite a lot of focus but on social media i wasn't really on instagram until covid came along and then it became a very useful tool for kind of keeping up with without things. having to have too many kind of doom and gloomy conversations where you have to your kind of 20 minute caveat at the start of every every time you had a chat with anyone in the industry about how difficult things were and how yeah. bad things were um it meant you got to you know stay in touch with you know with with what was going on in the wider industry with friends with family without having to have loads of conversations yeah. um all of the time and that you know that was you know, that's quite that's quite a nice thing um yeah but um yeah i mean going back to the tiktok thing i think that um it's here to stay it's a huge huge beast it's only going to get bigger and bigger yeah. i'm fascinated to see what's next what's actually kind of beyond that got a friend who's working on a uh he's working for a um a blockchain um uh social media startup and i think there's going to be some huge leap forwards in that because at the moment people are so happy to sort of prostitute their data yeah to big tech and with you know tiktok being the you know the mother of all death stars on that yeah. on that in, in that capacity you know the amount of information they can get about you your habits <laughs> your house it's everything wild. you do it's wild people what are you doing yeah, you know is. I'm conscious of talking to you on a podcast and showing too much of my home <laughs> you know yeah uh you know uh you know literally just bearing all um to everyone and anyone and you know whatever ai and machine learning wants to be kind of you know sort of laid over the top of it um so i think there's going to be a big u-turn moment with regards to social media in the next sort of five years where people start to go hold on a second we have been guinea pigs here in this crazy social mm-hmm. experiment it's given us trump yeah it's yes yeah. it's given us this sort of arab spring and yes it's given us like lots of kitten pictures and nice pictures of granny but it's also given us brexit trump yeah. cambridge analytica yeah. you know uh death threats black lives matter and all the hate and bipolar madness around yeah. that 
you know, um, and the kind of, you know, the complete, you know, pushing the world into two halves just when the world couldn't really needed to kind of give itself a hug. Um, and, you know, all of the baggage that comes with that, some point people are going to go, hold on, we've, you know, we've been, you know, we've been, we've been duped here. Yeah. Well, I, and it's very, it's very a, clever people, you know, to, uh, I mean, the analogy I give, it's like, we're in an interesting point with data. It's, it's a bit like in, in World War One, where, um, like, offensive warfare, the, the means mm. of meeting out offensive warfare far outstripped the, the, the you know, the technology of defensive warfare. To totally, so yeah. start World War One, you had machine guns, yeah. you had, yeah. like, armor-piercing shells, you had hand grenades just being invented. Yeah. Um, and on so you could do a lot of killing quite easily yeah on the defensive side of things and horses it was like don't wear red coats the yeah. british army were wearing red coats to start <laughs> world war one for starters blending with your background yeah wear a helmet um uh that actually you know protects you from shrapnel uh dig a hole in the ground and put loads of like barbed wire in front of it so people can't get to you and then sit there and, and let them the fucking rain down hell on you so you know by World War II, you know, the mechanised warfare had become a thing and, you know, suddenly you had, you know, air support and tanks mm, yeah. and, you know, and everything else. So it was like World War I, if you if you got like, you know, uh, you know, a mile's worth of, you know, of, of advance, that was considered a huge victory. And then you get pushed back 500 metres and you're still, like, you know, coming out on top. World War II, if you had to kind of, you know, retreat. 20 miles to then go 100 miles around the side that was you know that was how it's fought yeah i very much yeah. it's a f- funny analogy but i think we're in the similar situation with you know with 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 how our data is is is, is used the, the ability to grab and acquire and use data mm. is so much more evolved than the ability to defend yourself from that well i th- i think for me as as an artist as well um and somebody that runs a, a record label and I think for me, the thing that I've found really appealing um, that I've been trying to work with on with the team for a while and we're kind of still in talks about it, but it's how to create how to make everything more insular. And I, I that isn't that's kind of bringing a, a fan base to you where they you have a very you you so you have a you have a fan base you have your super fans and you have your fans and then you have the kind of people that know who you are that don't really follow you but they they know who you are and then you have the people that don't know who you are and for me it's like how do you create them as many of those into super fans so that you can yeah. kind of have them in almost like a patreon and only fans yeah. things it's like, like that the, it's like the kind of thousand fan theory and exactly this is you know it's like yeah it, it, it's interesting you compare patreon and only fans because those are very very good examples yeah. of ones where you do have these kind of like siloed ecosystems and i think that's really going to be you know there's going to be a huge there's I, I can think of a couple of a couple of of, of um a, you know of blockchain startups in social media which are basically trying they're trying to do that and they're trying to basically allow uh, you know, creators mm. or you know people like yourselves to monetize their own content, yeah. keep their fans happy, but not have to give away the kind of quid pro quo of mm. all of the data that comes with that to a third party. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's really what I was saying with regards to like yeah. you know wrestling back that kind of like you know getting the state the, the equilibrium back between kind of like you know offensive and defensive mm. you know kind of data. Um, you know, I think that's going to be that's going to be a really big big thing over the next five years, and I think there's going to be some bit. I'm, I'm very interested to see because you know it was Instagram, and then it was Vine was there for a hot second alongside Instagram, and then Snapchat came along and just killed it. Yeah. Um, and then TikTok has come along, and people do still use Snapchat. You know, I, I think I can think of a lot of my younger friends who still use Snapchat, but it's everything's about TikTok now. It's about what's next after TikTok. Yeah. I'd love to know what's the you know because you know when the thought of you know it's a bit like um you know any of these sort of you know sort of tech revolutions where mm. someone explains oh what you really want to go and put like you know a minute long video of yourself on you know on, on online yeah. how's that different from what's been before why is that what's that what makes that different from youtube like it's shorter yeah you know um but you know to see how completely you know disruptive that's been um and 
allowed people to create these crazy platforms for themselves yeah. you know yeah. pretty much from their from their bedroom or bathroom or kitchen mm. you know whatever mm. they're doing um is is kind of uh uh is kind of uh it's kind of brilliant uh, but i just yeah i'm fascinated to see what the you know what the next the next uh you know sort of big social media innovations i, is I personally going. think the the next thing is going to be more insular and and like look at look at what's happened with only fans and patreon over over covid it's allowed people to earn fortunes from a very small amount of fan base compared to yeah. what their major social social media is so i think like only fans say that like well for me i think the that the, the other big thing that you have to kind of talk about talk about i'm uh, spending a lot of time at the moment um you know um working in 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 um, blockchain project projects yeah. alongside music stuff and you know one of the big uh sort of uh forefronts or like um you know horizons that are opening up in not only in music but across any kind of fandom and when mm. i say fandom or loyalty is the concept of of you know of, of, of tokenization yeah um what tokenization means is effectively in layman's terms in like the most simpler terms whether you're into milan or you're dua lipa uh, or your tesco's or morrison's yeah, yeah or, okay walmart um uh, <laughs> for your american <laughs> listeners um um it's basically loyalty points, yeah. you know, but done in a way that's, it's, 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 that's, that's, you know, that's fully kind of, uh, you know, ledged on the blockchain. But imagine that you're like, okay, we'll use you as an example, you know, Will Clark launches, uh, you know, Will Coin. Yeah. And, you know, as a, a, as a, as an avid fan of Will, um, you know, I can come on your website and I can join up, sign up, get my, you know, my, mm. my Will wallet and um and start earning and as a sign up you'll get maybe 50 coins yeah. yeah yeah then every time you can you can base there and this is already happening i'm just describing yeah, yeah. it you know an existing an existing paradigm but um every time someone likes a post on of yours on instagram they'll get you know a will coin yeah every time they stream a track of yours on uh spotify they get five yeah every time they listen to you know, a mix on SoundCloud and that all the APIs exist to integrate in. So it, your, your fans are constantly, as they're engaging with your ecosystem, with your social media, your Spotify, buying tickets to your gigs, buying your records, mm. they're gathering up coins, yeah. you know, and they're going into their wallet. And then they can then use those to get half price in the merch store, yeah. you know, like VIP package for, you mm. know, for club nights, you know, advanced knowledge, new news on tickets and touring um and and so on and so on and so on yeah and that is going to become so common and I, that will power this whole ecosystem i think of of as you say of a kind of inclusion um um and you know um you know creating these kind of ecosystems around artists that don't depend on social media and don't depend on you know on on, on, on other, other kind of paradigms um and that's really quite exciting. And I know a lot of people are really starting to kind of lean into this. Yeah, because um, I, I, th I think like from you, from your experience as a manager and you'll be able to kind of say it, but and, or kind of agree, I hope you do as well anyway. But in in our scene, I it's in all the scenes, I would have thought, but until you get to the certain level where you're so fucking big that it doesn't matter. But there's almost like a promoters agents managers artists between all of those relationships there's always barriers between all of them there's there's certain things in 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 all of those that there's barriers up promoters don't want to give data to the artist because they're afraid of giving away their data yet the the artists are actually giving the data to the promoters to ask people to buy tickets Mm -hmm. And there's this thing where, for me, it doesn't make any sense where we need the promoters and the promoters need us. But there's still not really a case where the promoters are allowing, are sharing that data so that we can create a fan experience that's much better for the fans. And I think that's, for, like, in our scene, I think that's where things are going to improve as well yeah yeah, yeah. because I think so. because 
like I would love it if I could tell like half the people I don't know you would get this a lot I could imagine as a manager one of your artists let's say one of your artists is playing in Bristol the club sells the tickets the artist puts on their Instagram that they're playing in Bristol and then the night after the show there's a hundred people that are going why did I not know that this person was playing in the city and that's that's what i find the issue with is that by having having a, a platform where people see a hundred percent of your stuff at, yeah. or they're notified a hundred percent if they if they really are your yeah. super fan yeah. or whatever you call it these people but should again, know. that's you know that's that's that that goes back to putting your putting your you know the you know the, the promoter is only going to be able to promote the events with the tools given to him exactly or her you know that's you know which is you know might be mailing lists but it's probably going to be social media yeah probably going to be facebook and instagram you know um um and so th- then you're you know you're beholden to the, the whims of the algorithm yeah. so yeah but yeah i think there's you know there's there's a there's a lot that's going to sharpen up and change but to be honest at the moment it's always it still does to me feel a little bit theoretical talking about all of these things because i'm just so like in the the sort of uh, going back to what we were saying right at the start of the, the podcast, you know, this kind of like, uh, you know, um, glory dawn of, yeah. of, of of being able to actually go out again. And, you know, it seems quite strange to be, you know, getting so uh, sort of granular on, you mm. know, something that's been so, you know, been, you've been, um, you know, taken, taken away for us for so long. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's, it's, it's, um, you know, it's been, it's been a wonderful few weeks in the UK. I know that a lot of people are hurting in Europe. And it's an absolute shit show in Holland at the moment with the way that, you know, the government seems to have handled their whole vaccine rollout and the, um, uh, you know, and the, uh, the, you know, the shutting of all of the clubs and they've they basically shuttered everything till November now, which yeah, means ADAs, no ADC, yeah. everything's shut down, which is, you know, that's that's really really sad. So I'm conscious of being too, you know, for if you have got you know sort of global listeners of being too kind of like hallelujah. But yeah. how are things in the US? It's interesting. Uh, it it's city by city, so. Um, most places are fully open, fine, good to go. Um, a few cities, San Francisco is struggling massively, um, on ticket sales and just, je- I think what happened is it, I was there on Sunday, played a show and it was great, but it just feels like everything is super strict on another level. Um, and of like uh, like rules and rules and regulations, rules and regulations. Like we, they're checking vaccine cards everywhere. Um, oh. You're not allowed in anywhere if you don't have a vaccine. Um, the, I think a lot of people left the city during COVID, mm-hmm. um, so it's almost like a ghost town, which is very weird for for like going to San Francisco. That's usually a hustle bustle city. Um, and now it's it's not. Um, I know I spoke to many promoters there, and you could put the biggest artists on, and they don't sell out. Um, mm-hmm. Which, in you go to other places, and it's completely the opposite, where it sells yeah. sells out overnight. So I think it just depends what city you're in. I played. It's literally polar opposites. I played Texas last weekend, and San Francisco, and they're just worlds apart. As a mask mm-hmm. mask mandate in Dallas at this moment in time, no one abides by it. No one, no one cares. No one does anything to do with it. No one's checking vaccines. No one's. So it's like it's state by state. It's all political in the US, which is kind of sad. Um, but it's also, I don't know. I don't know where it's going. I don't know if things are going to start closing down. I really don't know. Um, what about in the UK? I mean, at the moment, you know, it seems to be all systems go. Um, and, uh, you know, in a very nice way, there's been a few sort of notable sort of sad stories, like how to not being able to go ahead. Um, yeah. and that was just difficult because, you know, they weren't given quite enough of a lead time in to properly, you know, execute on the festival. Yeah. But most yeah. of the, most of the other festivals, you know, Lost Village is happening this weekend. Mm. Um, I was at Wilderness a couple of weekends ago. Uh, we out here happened last weekend. Um, just one just gone. So, um, you know, a lot of people are getting to go and kind of dance in a field for the first time. Yeah. Nightclubs are all open. 
people are still getting sick. A lot of people have COVID, but no one I know has got really sick or has ended up in hospital. Yeah. Um, and so at the moment, it's sort of like, you know, there was a big hue and cry when they delayed the reopening by a month, but it, that, that seems to have paid off and seems yeah. to have worked. Um, what will happen when the winter comes and people start to get ill from other things remains to be seen. Um, and um, so all one can really do is cross the fingers and hope that there's been enough vaccines rolled out by that stage for it to really move the dial. But at the yeah. moment, you know, things are, things feel pretty pretty good and pretty normal for the first yeah. time in a very, very long while. Which is nice. Um, it's uh, nice to hear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, it, it's good to hear. And I just, you know, really my thoughts are kind of, you know, leading into 2022. This year has been such a strange and kind of topsy-turvy year. Um, but um, I think in a, in a sort of strange way, a lot of people actually needed this. Yeah. You know, they needed this slap in the cosmic slap in the face to actually remind them that you know the um the analogy i've given before is the uh you know the sherpa people in the himalayas um uh they are taught from a, a very early age when they get tired when they're walking out climbing at altitude um you know if they if they get tired and fatigued and you know f- you know feel that you know it's, it's hard to carry on what their way of dealing with it is they'll go and pick up a you know the biggest boulder or rock that they can find and run with it for as far as they can and then put put it down yeah and obviously when you put it down it's that kind of buddhist you know sort of uh trope of seeking discomfort um you put the rock down you feel lighter and you feel easier and so it's 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 easier to go on um and you know that picking up that rock and running with it has been what we've all been doing Mm. over coronavirus for the last 18 months how how was how was your kind of pivot during coronavirus? Because I know we we hung out a couple of times and grabbed food, and you were working on a lot of things. And uh, like, yeah, I mean, the how did you find months, it? But, yeah, I mean, uh, last year was immensely tough. Yeah. Um, you know, watching the whole kind of live music scene kind of just burn down around you, and you know, the thing that was difficult was the sort of the the un the sort of the fact that. You know, I wrote an article quite near the start of COVID, which was at the time people kind of, you know, uh, a lot of people came out and kind of praised me for my bluntness. Yeah. A lot of people were like quite dismissive of how dystopian I'd been in my outlook mm. on, you know, what was potentially to come. Actually reading back on it, I was pretty kind of light on the actual kind of enormity. In that. Yeah. that was, it was written in March last year and, um uh i was approached by ra to do a think piece and you know my thoughts about you know the, the you know the, the coming pandemic or the onset of the pandemic mm. and um i you know I, I pulled no punches i was quite kind of you know sort of stark in my kind of uh, appraisal of the situation and um you know looking back on it now you know there was a time where people were saying oh you know we'll be reopening time for the summer oh no we'll be reopening time for you know 18 months later yeah. we've just reopened and there's a high chance we may have to go back into lockdown again exactly. this winter yeah you know so this is not the walk in the park that everyone was expecting and last year the difficult thing was the sort of constantly changing narrative you know one minute it's this and the next minute it's that and you know it's like this constantly moving target that you could never quite um you know you know kind of you know measure or you know or, 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 or grasp um and so, um, yeah, it, it was, you know, it was an Im- immensely tough year. Um, and, you know, the difficult thing about working in, in music management is that um, you, you know, if you're deriving your income from earning a percentage of, you know, artists' wages who are themselves earning zero, mm. you know, 15, 20% of zero is zero. Yeah. And so you're not earning. Um, uh, but at the same time, you do have a duty of care to kind of, you know, to, 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 to you know, to stand, stand by artists, artists in time of need. Yeah. It's very difficult to, and at the same time, you have to put food on the table and you have to, you know, to, to, you know, to survive and, so and, keep very, men- very and, keep, and kind of keep mentally sane, I think on top of all of that stress and everything like that, because we all have families, yeah. we all have external things that need more of our time and we can't just be su- super selfish and just worry about ourselves for that time as well yeah i mean it's 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 yeah it's it's it was i mean one of the sort of big kind of highlights and challenges of last year was the was the you know the, the just being at home with the kids for you know huge swathes of time yeah i mean they spent i think they spent about eight weeks at school 
Yeah. <laughs> Once the pandemic had kicked in, it was like eight weeks after that of, of actual schooling. The rest of the time they were at home. Yeah. Um, and um, that's a lot of time to spend with your kids, which was on one hand absolutely amazing, on the other hand enormously challenging because yeah, you know you've actually got to kind of you know shepherd their education while dealing with all of the kind of you know the the more um challenges that challenging aspects of what was going on yeah. and all the kind of the worry and everything that goes on behind it exactly. but yeah i'm keen not to dwell too much on that because that's very much in the past and to be honest anyone who's worked in the music industry has had to you know to gone through it anyone through. who's been a business owner an artist or whatever has had similar challenges totally. to, to face yeah. you know and you know i think that you know some were a lot luckier than others yeah. um you know there was you know some artists managed to get state support some artists didn't you know um some artists have you know parents that could go and go and, go and stay with mm. some artists you know have you know young families it's like totally very much horses for courses but everyone had a tough time and totally I think, you know the main thing is that we're we're out of it going back to your question of how does one pivot out of it um i think you have to you have to look at what your skill set is and you have to, you know, work from that sideways really. And, you know, in, in every direction that you, that, that, you know, possible. Um, for me, um, you know, the, um, the real kind of uh, silver linings, uh, you know, through this, uh, especially this last six months is the kind of the, the sort of reality of, 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 um, the situation has become clearer and clearer with regards to kind of, you know, the, what the, the sort of, you know, long-term repercussions of COVID were going to look like, yeah. um, have been, you know, getting more involved in, in, in music and blockchain tech consultancy and, you know, very fortuitously as well, the kind of the, the, all of the kind of innovations that have happened in, in, you know, the world of crypto and blockchain in the last eight months to a year, yeah. um, you know, with, Firstly, with the kind of the you know the the most recent bull run, but also then with the the birth of um, non fungible tokens yeah. and you know NFT and that whole world of of you know of of kind of creativity, ridiculousness, yeah. you know, yeah. um, <laughs> new technology, new frontiers, and complete you know for me that's been a wonderful distraction against the slightly more totally. existential nature of what's been going on in 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 in, in the music industry when, when when nfts kind of were born that month was wild it was it was a crazy month two months of just everyone doing i mean it's crazy it's it was crazy then and then oh no nfts are dead yeah. oh no they're done and it's like hold on a second there's a thing called the gartner hype cycle the gartner hype cycle goes like that and then like that and then like that yeah and uh, we've just gone over the crest and into the, what's called the trough of disillusionment, and we're just about to go into liftoff. And you know, we're in a current another period of completely crazy fucking pyramid scheme type liftoff in that respect regard. Yeah. With insane amounts of money changing hands for some things for projects with real value and some for projects that are just utter nonsense cash grab. <laughs> yeah. But it's absolutely That's brilliant life. to watch. That's it's life, right? Though. On the sidelines of that, it's just like when on earth in imagine that you could buy baseball cards for you know like 50 quid each sell them three months later sorry 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 in some cases eight days later i'm thinking of the on one project yeah. this is a project that's a project that launched like eight days ago yeah. yeah and they were like 200 quid each at mint didn't i didn't get any at mint wasn't aware of them until yeah. a couple of days ago when someone said you should look at this but you know these 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 individual nfts the cheapest you can get one for now is about fifteen thousand yeah. pounds, like twenty thousand dollars, you know, and that's in eight days. Now, part of that's utterly ridiculous, and part of it's kind of brilliant, and that kind of juxtaposition I'm really into. Well, I think uh, this more importantly, what I'm into is the actual underlying technology and what this means for the the future of digital assets and the future of our kind of digital existence. And I think this is a really important thing to kind of you know to highlight. It's like it took about a nanosecond for me to understand the context con concept of NFTs. It was yeah. first explained to me about three years ago by a friend of mine, Walter, who works in VR art. And he was like, there will be this point quite soon where you can watermark digital art and yeah. pieces of digital art. He was really talking in terms of like complex pieces of VR art that you mm. could kind of climb inside and experience. And he's like, you'll be able to watermark these, you'll be able to sell them and galleries will buy them. And then you'll be able to kind of like tokenize them and you'll be able to climb inside them and have this experience 
that's owned by the gallery and gated by the gallery. That was the mm. example he gave. And that made total sense to me straight away. So when NFTs, you know, started coming into the general vernacular in maybe September, October, November of last year, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, I need to pay attention to these. Um, and then seeing them kind of roll out initially, everyone was like, oh, well, it's just a JPEG. Well, yeah. It is a JPEG, but it's what the underlying technology represents. Um, and you know, really, the you know the, the fundamentals is you know there's, uh, I mean, that's a that's a painting by Banksy. Yeah, a print by Banksy. Yeah, the reason it's a print by Banksy is because it's signed by Banksy in the corner, and it's got a piece of paper that comes with it, which I currently can't find, but it's somewhere <laughs> um, that says from Pass Control that yeah. says it's a Banksy, um, and um, uh, so the, you know, the, the, the reason that, you know, if I was to take that off the wall, run a, run a photocopy of it, send it to you, it would be worth the value of the photocopy, photocopy yeah, and yeah. nothing else. Yeah. yeah. The thing that makes it legitimate is the provenance that comes with it. And all NFTs are, is that for digital art. Yeah. And I think it's, I know, think it's the that thing... simple, really. And if you apply that sideways to, you know, um, you know, let's say uh, legal patents, yeah, you know, or you know, sneakers to wear in virtual worlds. Bearing in mind that the decision makers of tomorrow, the kids who are at school playing Fortnite and Minecraft, right now they'd probably rather spend a hundred bucks and turn it into V bucks and buy a cool pair of limited sneakers to wear on their avatar in Fortnite totally. then they would actually go and pay, buy a pair of you know yeah. Nike Air Max you know and that's the bit that most people are missing when they're saying oh well it's just a JPEG for me it's the that. thing that the thing that really stands out for me um is that the original artist can still get a percentage of the profits yeah and i think this is something that we've all kind of come across in well in all art right your music becomes or your art becomes more valuable after after it's released after somebody yeah. else has owned it whether yeah. that's a pair of sneakers whether that's a t-shirt whether that's an album whether that's a picture whatever um and you have people making obscene amounts of money on from other secondary from, market from art, tertiary market yeah from artist work and the artists aren't necessarily making that money um and that's the one thing i love about nfts is that artists can get paid and yeah. i think this is this was kind of what i was pivoting onto with being an artist manager for you mm -hmm. is the financial the finances it as managing an artist you're purely relying on what that money that the artist makes and then yeah. you get a percentage from it streaming we're all getting not all of us but some of us are getting millions of streams and yeah. earning pennies from it yeah how does that change um i think there's 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 a big court case going on in the uk at the moment where um some some rather amazing lawyers are, are really kind of sticking it to spotify um you know for uh you know for for, for their for their sort of you know their their you know the royalties that they're paying out mm. um it's interesting you actually mentioned that one of the other uh you know one of my other main focuses during this 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 time has been um a new music streaming startup that i've been um i've been uh I've taken a, a, a sort of senior advisory position within um which is really trying to solve this problem for um for uh as much for uh you know um musicians as for curators and people mm. who you know present other people's music yeah um the company is called kiki and um it's um uh, a london-based um streaming startup that's really focused on trying to capture all of the music that falls between the cracks in a big dsp like spot mm. like spotify yeah um there's so much music the, the problem with spotify is it, is it it really treats um algorithmically it treats music as mass you know it says you are a you know uh 35 year old uh i don't i'm not sure how old you're younger than that 30, you? 31 uh, yeah but 31 same you're a 31 bracket. year old you know you're a 31 year old you know white male living in detroit 
I'm going to play you similar music from the other 31 year old white males in Detroit listen to. Yeah. Or they're going to go, okay, your friends on social media listen to this, so we are going to play you similar. Yeah. You know, or you listen to mainly to rock. So we're going to play, so you're not going to listen to You may listen to mainly like house and techno. So we're just going to play you more house and techno. Yeah. Nothing that really challenges you that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that we identified really is the best way to kind of, you know, to, to, to discover music and to tell stories is through, through long form audio, mm-hmm. not through individual tracks, individual tracks. You know, you're reliant on playlists, you're reliant on, you know, quite complex algorithms that are going to just show you, you know, more of same. Mm-hmm. Um, and really we want to show you more of different, mm-hmm. but in a kind of structured way. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the, 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 the problem that Kiki is trying to solve is, you know, allowing people to discover new music in a way that feels organic and natural in a closed curated environment. So this is effectively imagine like, um, Netflix, but for long form audio, okay. the big difference between this and say Spotify or SoundCloud is that anyone can't just come and post on the platform. The platform is closed and is curated by a team of very skilled curators yeah. who choose the content that goes on there. Um, and, you know, with that in mind, that suddenly means that you can, you know, really uh, sort of blow open the doors on creative storytelling through music. Mm. And, you know, you can show listeners music in a, because you're using long form audio and, you know, we're, you know, sort of building on the, you know, the kind of show format of, 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 a, of a platform like Netflix. Um to show episodic content around a specific theme. So that could be, you know, bumpy UK garage. Mm. It could be a nostalgic retrospective of rave. It could be just 14 hours of straight Somalian jazz. Yeah. Um, it could be a kind of hybrid, you know, radio show style, you know, like, uh, you know, part singing, you know, part playing tunes, part talking kind of, you know, podcast radio show hybrid and everything in between. Yeah. Um, with really with the focus on global music so all bases covered it's not specialist econo- um, um, uh, electronic uh, although all specialist electronic genres will be catered for yeah um it's not uh you know too focused on rock pop or hip-hop but there will be all of those genres you know in in their kind of niche guises you know properly catered for but also really shining a light on you know african music um uh, South American music, Caribbean music, um, music from the Asia, um, you know, from, from, from all over Asia yeah. uh, and all of the kind of micro scenes that fit together with an idea being to introduce listeners to new music that they've not heard before um, and engage artists with new fans. Mm. And the, um, the kind of going back to what you were saying about streaming, the kind of really disruptive thing that, that Kiki will be doing that other streaming platforms have not done before is to, um, for the first time ever through their, their, um, their advertising revenue system, um, will be to pay not only the tracks that are platformed on the network, uh, a royalty, but also the curator, DJ, radio host, podcaster, mm-hmm. who's actually brought that music to the platform, a um, uh, 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 streaming royalty as well, um, which will be very beneficial for, you know, musicians and specifically DJs, yeah. podcasters, radio hosts, you know, a lot of whom, like this podcast, you know, in six months time, will hopefully be living on, uh, will be living on Kiki. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, people will, you know, whenever they're streaming it, you know, they'll be getting exactly the same listening experiences they would be, you know, um, um, elsewhere. Uh, however, you will be getting a, uh, um, you know, you'll be, you'll be getting a, a streaming revenue every time, every time that happens. And that's quite a wonderful thing. And that's quite disruptive. And it's a, you know, uh, it, it will create a whole new um, uh, incentive to go and curate music, you know, because there's so yeah. many people like, you know, you do this, you do this, you know, this podcast is a, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a passion project for you. Um, you know, you do it because you love it. There's so many people who are doing, you know, cool stuff on SoundCloud, Mixcloud, wherever, because they love it. Yeah. Um, if you then add a, an incentive to actually, you know, do that and do it more and do it better and, you know, and to really lean into it from a kind of creative storytelling point of view. And what we're really interested in with Peaky is, is people who come to us, we're like, I'm, you know, I wouldn't be so interested in, you know, the, I don't know, the, the, Seth Troxler show, let's just say, yeah. you know, just 
Seth, you know, actually, Seth was probably a bad example. Seth, <laughs> Seth, be Seth show good. Probably absolutely brilliant. <laughs> because, um, it would just be him being him yeah. and, you know, playing loads of cool, weird records. So we probably would say yes to that. But we would also love to hear, you know, Seth's deep dive into Detroit House. Yeah. Or, you know, the records that, you know, first Seth first, you know, listened to when he discovered, you know, Rich yeah. and, you know, the whole kind of, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Minus Crew in Detroit mm. started hanging out with them. You know, there's certain things that sort of give a snapshot of time, a snapshot in time, or you know, tell a story. You know, we've got some great shows incubating at the incubating at the moment. Um, you know, about all sorts of eras of of, of musical history, yeah. um, and uh, specific genres and subgenres, uh, specific individuals, um, and that's going to become really exciting as we start to kind of build out the content base. That's interesting. So, so how's it, how's it going to work with? Um is it going to be almost like a quintessential streaming platform as well? Um, or is it more so, so like with Spotify, Apple music, it, the, like as a record label, you distribute it to your distributors and then the distributors pass it. Distribute well, we're not, on. we're not, we're not dealing with, we're only dealing with long form audio here. Okay. So the, you know, the, the, there's no, you know, if you're a record label, you're not, you know, you you might want to go and, you know, get the dj you know you might want to reach out to the dj with the big regular show yeah. that people are listening to week on week and say you know um you know please play our please play our record mm. uh, because we want it we, we want we want it on kiki but okay. we Makes stay sense. removed from that yeah i mean really the best way to think of a kiki is really uh is um it's like a global radio station with hundreds of different channels i like that, that concept that you can listen to on demand mm. in no particular order. It's not like it's like you've got to listen to say, you know, this is the nighttime show or whatever. Yeah. It's like, you know, um, but with the interface of of a of a Netflix type platform and one that really gets to know you as a listener wow. without abusing your data, you know, and that's you know, I think the you know the most important things is you know the, to, to to really highlight is you know over time as you listen to it, and we're really going to lean into the um into the uh, you know the kind of UI UX experience of yeah. this, and you know, really, you know, making uh, you're making that whole listening experience as, as you know as 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 comfortable and enticing and engaging as possible. Um, but you know that's uh, you know that discovery of music and getting people really excited about listening to music, um, and you know, really for me as well is you know the the, the best ideas are the simplest. You know, the th- the thought of having something where imagining I'm having a dinner party and I want 10 hours of, of, of ballet funk, yeah. you know, or like, you know, or, or, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, Afrobeat, yeah. you know, um, just to play while I'm having food and you just click play and just mm. leave it to play and it'll just, you know, it'll play and play and play. Or if you want music to go jogging to, you know, of a specific BPM. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or if you want to do a really deep dive into kind of like Romanian techno and learn everything about all the kind of key, you know, exponents of, of, of you know, of that specific scene. So it, it yeah. can, al- will... it can also be quite an educational tool as well. Oh, absolutely. Which yeah. I, I mean, think yeah. that this, this is really interesting as well. And I like this because I'm coming across and I'm sure you've come across this a lot in the past being a manager is that you find an artist that, and this isn't a bad thing at all. I think this is an interesting thing that's happening a lot nowadays anyway, but you're finding artists that they know what they want to do. They know where they want to go, but they're influenced. They don't actually know the history of what, where they're coming from. And I think that's really interesting because like now I was talking to some friends the other day in, in America and like their first ever show was like Cascade. And I was yeah. playing them like references of what Cascade would sample in the past, and they'd never heard of them. If you know what I mean, and I think this, yeah. I think that's amazing. I love that. But with what you're kind of saying with Kiki, is people can really educate themselves on where it came from, where initially it started. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, absolutely it's uh, uh, you you've kind of hit the nail on the head. The whole sort of thrust for the for, for you know for the platform is on it's on musical discovery and it's on you know a musical education yeah you know, we want to be showing you know we want we want you know we want a show uh that you know that, that gives you a 
a snapshot into a specific era in musical history. Mm. You know, um, we've got, you know, numerous plans afoot for, you know, commissioning specific shows, looking at, you know, specific influences. You know, we're, we're, we're you know, the one, one example that was given last week is, you know, to do a series of shows around the, um, the, the Amen break. And, yeah. you know, it's something that's been touched on before, but no one's really, really gone. And, you know, there's so many ways you could look at that. So, yeah. You know, you can come at it from the, you know, misrepresentation of, of black artists and the fact that, you know, that they, they he never, he never actually got, you know, he died penniless, you know, yeah. having written a piece of music that's then one of the most sample pieces of music in, in, in history. Yeah. You know, um, you can look at it from, you know, the, you know, how it's been used over so many different, you know, different genres and eras and, yeah. you know, entire show on, you know, on the birth of jungle and drum and bass and, you know, and on and on and on. There's so many ways you can look at something like that. And one, that's one short sample of music. Yeah. Think about the whole of music and all of the different kind of, you know, eras in time and the stories that can be told around that. Um, and it's going to make it And again, I just, you know, you put yourself in the shoes of the end listener. I would want to listen to that. Totally. You know? Is there is there going to be like a visual aspect to it at all? No, yeah. the visual aspect, the, the visual aspect, there's a very strong design aspect yeah. in the fact that, you know, one of the difficult things about SoundCloud and MixCloud and YouTube is that, you know, there's, you know, YouTube people, you can choose your art, but there's no filter on that. There's no yeah. filter on the quality. You know, you could pick and you could spend ages doing an amazing piece of artwork to put on your yeah. front cover, or you could just like, you know, do a squiggle. And there's well, no one actually sort of stopping or controlling that. Yeah. We yeah. control all of, the, all of the design output for the network. And, um, um, and so it's, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, unified and it's graphically really impressive. Uh, each show has its own artwork, which is delivered in, um, uh, in collaboration between us, Kiki and the, the artist or, you know, their kind yeah. of, you know, their, their wider team. How, how, um, how does a user, how, how would a user pay for this then? Is it a subscription? It's free. Is it free? Free. That's, you know, and um, at the end of the year, we'll be adding adverts of about yeah. um, about nine seconds ahead of every of, ahead of every stream, yeah. which is quite normal in, you know, in podcast land. Yeah. But that's yeah. the only advert you'll listen to, um, you know, per, per stream. And, you know, and, uh, you know, the advertising that's delivered through that will be, you know, Based specific for you, for you, you yeah. know, you'll, you'll, you know, it'll be of a, you know, you're not going to get if you're, a, you know, if you're a white 31 year old male in Detroit, you're not going to be getting like, uh, you know, nappy adverts or diaper <laughs> adverts, um, you know, or like L'Oreal skin cream. Yeah. Um, uh, that you might be getting like Xbox or PlayStation. Yeah. Um, so, and, uh, so is it going to be like an app as well? Yes. And a desktop yeah, app It'll as be well. available. Uh, yeah. The desktop beat is already up and, and, and running the iOS and uh, Android are built um, and in, in, in going in testing at the moment. I mean, nice. we're, re we're really looking to roll out you know, um, probably realistically early next year with the kind of big kind of forward facing push. Amazing. Um, but you know, we're in no, we're in no crazy rush because you know, the, the moment it's, you know, we're just, you know, making sure that it's tooled up with enough enticing content to really, you know, move the dial when, when we do start talking about it. It's gotta be uh, right. It's gotta be right. 100% because yeah. it, that first user experience is the, is the yeah. most key. And yeah, and we're we're spending a lot of time on that. The there's moment. there's so many there's so many things that I've come across in the past where the concept is great, the idea is great, and then it's just executed so poorly, and you're just yeah. like, actually, no, this. It's like meeting work. a beautiful girl, and then you go to kiss her, and she's got stinking breath. <laughs> like, get away from me. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's it, it's yeah, it's not. Uh, it's first impressions mean everything in so many things, mm. and. Um, uh, it, I think it's really, really important to, you know, to, and we're very, very, very aware of that. Yeah, uh, totally. And which is why we're not, you know, I'm not Russian. saying, right, go to, you know, giving you a, you know, a, 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 a URL to go jumping on, you know, you'll know it when it comes yeah. and we're really excited for that moment. But in the meantime, you know, we're heads down, just kind of, um, you know, making it happen really. Can't and, wait to um, see it, man. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to kind of talk a little bit. It would be kind of rude not to, to talk about management. Um, yeah, of you, you kind of you between you and Rag, you guys ran the probably one of the most influential management companies, I would say, in electronic dance music um, over the last 
10 years i think it's been that long maybe it's very maybe. kind of you to say that i mean uh, i probably say yeah i would say there's, there's just, uh, underground electronic dance music maybe but it's very that's very kind of you to say that i, I guess uh, that's the scene that i kind of roll in so it, yeah. it is and, and i think um i like from the the not the beginning of my career but when i kind of first heard about you guys um it was always like it was always the management company um and everyone would know that in, in the industry and i kind of just want to let, let's talk about the, the how it started um because i think people would be really interested in this yeah. and kind of how, how mean, the so whole thing started i i um my original uh path into electronic music was through music journalism i was um I sort of fell into, I was, I'd always been a fan of writing. I'd always been okay at writing, but I'd never really done much writing. And then I suddenly started getting a couple of like offers to go and, you know, would you like to go to Miami Winter Music Conference yeah. to go and write for Mixmag about? And I was like, it ha- did kind of help that my best mate was then the kind of features editor. Yeah. Um, he started giving me these kind of like, oh, so-and-so's dropped out, Ed, can you do it type, you know, writing gigs. And I went and he obviously did an okay job because I kept getting asked back. So I was doing lots of freelance gigs, you know, for, for magazines like DJ Mag and Mixed Mag mm. and enjoying it and getting to kind of go to cool places like Miami and, you know, with Japan and, you know, stuff like that. And then um, this regular gig came up to, to write the techno page for Mixed Mag. Mm. And so I um, I did that for about eight years, um, which was which was amazing. I mean, I got to, I wasn't full-time staff, you know, I had another job alongside, um, but I got to, write about the music I was really into. Yeah. And at a time when, you know, techno was quite a, you know, it was, it was, it was quite a kind of broad church. Yeah. I mean, it's always yeah. been quite a broad church, but it was really at that time when it was like, yes, you had, you know, you kind of Ben Sims, Adam Bayer, you know, like, you know, you know, everything that was going on in, in that kind of world, Surgeon and, you know, the, you know, the yeah. and, and everything from Detroit. <laughs> but at the same time, you had minimal techno kicking off mm. and minus starting. And, you know, Ricardo Villalobos, you know, yeah. suddenly arriving on the scene um, and, you know, uh, the whole kind of, you know, German minimal thing really kicking into gear um, and all of these like exciting new frontiers opening up in techno. And from really kind of leaning into that and, you know, and um, just writing about the stuff I was into, you know, um, um, you know, be it... Um, you know, going to Demp and writing about to, to, to try electronic music conference yeah. or, um, you know, um, doing, uh, you know, the breakout articles about people like Ricardo Villalobos yeah. or Luciano. Um, uh, and then, you know, young kids, kids at the time, like, like Seth and Vision Quest, I kind of built up this network of, of, um, of kind of friends from journalism, people I knew, people I respected, people I interviewed for the first time. And, you know, a lot of those people were young artists like, like Seth and Jamie Jones and um, um, and um, the you know the Vision Quest guys, mm. um, uh, Saban, Richie Ahmed, um, who were you know they were they were mates first and foremost, yep. for hanging out and you know going to all sorts of things together. You know we just go to you know this constant conveyor belt of like you know Sonar and then you know Cocoon opening and then Glastonbury and yeah. then you know um, the Garden Festival in Croatia or you know whatever and. Um, you know, they, um, you know, from that built up a big kind of network of, 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 you know, of, of like-minded friends. And a lot of them were then getting to that point in their career where they needed a bit of a helping hand. And so, um, it was initially, it was, it was, uh, my friend Will from, um, from, uh, from NGE, which was then the Crosstown agency, but, yeah. um, the rebel agency, but, um, it's now called NGE bookings, um, um, who do your bookings. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> who reached out to me and um, said that he was thinking of starting a management company. And um, he um, he had this plan to basically create a management company that sat alongside um, um, alongside uh, his huge roster, really successful roster of, of, of artists at, 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 uh, at the agency. Um, and so I, you know, my first introduction was really coming in more in a kind of like press capacity as a kind of almost like a kind of press agent um, uh, with extra kind of management capabilities, I guess. Yeah. Um, but slowly over surely over time, it kind of grew into more of a kind of full spectrum management service, but to the point where, 
you know, I was trying to service way too many artists mm. and it was, um, you know, we had a, you know, by the end of that, that, you know, two year period, we had, we had way too many artists and I wasn't able to really do a proper job with all of them because there were just too many and there was only one of me. And it was just, you know, it, I, I kind of almost reached a point of burnout where it was just like, it'd been so much. And, um, I was really, um, just trying to kind of, you know, to, to, you know, to, 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 uh, you know, to do the best job for, you know, all of these different characters who were all at the point in their career where they, you know, their careers were really starting to boot off. And it was, yeah. I was finding myself spread too thinly. Um, and it was around that right in the kind of eye, the eye of the storm of that, that Dan eats everything ha- came to me with entrance song, um, which was his sort of breakout track. And Dan had been someone I known since he was 16 years old. Mm. And um, someone that, you know, been a really good friend of mine, dear friend of mine growing up. We've got done a lot of our kind of early DJing gigs together and got like early residences together in Bristol. We're both from Bristol. He's from a place called Wooten Under Edge, which is about, you know, 15, 20 minutes north of Bristol. Um, so, we, you know, we've been firm friends for a long time. And he'd been through a sort of strange transition where he'd had a period of quite solid success in the early 2000s. But then one thing and another had happened and he'd kind of just ended up getting a regular job and yeah. carried on making music and DJing, but not that, you know, with not that much success. And it got to a point where his, you know, his wife had put a kind of, you know, a time limit on it and said, look, then his now, now wife, then, then girlfriend has said, look, you know, you've got a year to kind of sort the DJing out or you've got to go and do something else. Yeah. And in, um, you know, nine months into that year, he came to me and Rag with with Entrance Song. Mm. He wrote this absolute banger, which Amazing you know uh, went on to you know to, to you know to be a you know a firm favorite of 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 of, of, uh, of 2011, the year that it came out. Um, and uh, you know, I it was at the absolutely you know kind of at my sort of breaking point with what was going on at work. But I'd always known that Dan was a phenomenally talented DJ. I mean, he's mm. always been the you know, he was always when we were growing up, he was the best DJ at parties. He could, you know, he could literally, you know, leave two de- two records with the crossfader in the middle and go to the loo and come back four minutes later and they'd still be, you know, completely locked. Yeah. Um and we'll do that without batting an eyelid. Um and so I knew that as soon as he started making tunes that really resonated, there was going to be something that, you know, that really could be built on there. Plus he's an amazing guy. And he was really at that point in his life where he's like, like I fucking want this. Mm. I really want this. This is my like, you know, I'm, I need to make this work. Yeah. And that's a great position to be in as an artist. You know, artists need to have that kind of that, that, you know, real urge to succeed. Um, and um, so when he came to us in the middle of this, you know, this huge, this, me in this hugely hectic period, the only thing I could think to do really was to reach out to my, my then close friend rag. Who at the time was um, one of the most successful club promoters in Bristol. Yeah. And just uh, see if there was anything that we could do together, just really as Dan's friend, to kind of help him out. Mm. And it was quite innocent at the time. It was like, okay, I'm I'm going to give Pete Chong a call and send him an email, send him some tunes, you know, just see if he's interested in playing Dan stuff on Radio One, and maybe Rag can get him some gigs because Rag was booking Motion, and it was really that simple to begin with. Yeah, and. I sent an email to Pete. I said, you know, I think I found the, you know, the, the you know, new up and coming, you know, talent, you know, for you to, to, to play on radio one. Pete jumped on the both records. Actually, it was, mm. it was, um, it was Henson song and the size. Yeah. And that, that kicked off. I think it was, I think Dan had, it was two different tracks played on two different shows on radio one for 13 consecutive weeks, mm. which was, you know, at the time was and finishing up with a live essential mix from motion. Yeah. So that was 13 weeks it took to go from nothing to everything playing his first essential mix live at rags club in bristol or the club that rag was booking at the time and um so that was pretty amazing which for anybody that, listening to an essential mix is like the, it's a big deal in especially back then it's a big deal now but back then it was a huge deal yeah um and they've been sort of like you know sort of talismanic uh you know uh you know, just uh linchpin of kind of Saturday, Saturday night radio on radio one. Yeah. Um, and actually I think, I mean, I think it had moved to Friday night by that stage. Yeah. But it always used to be Saturdays. Mm. Um, 
but um yeah so then it was it was clear that you know we there was there was definitely something something going on and I had to make the difficult decision to really to kind of you know to break away from from Will and the previous management company and start again you know from scratch taking some of the artists you know just a more manageable roster of artists with um and you know bringing rag into the fray and around the same time you know Seth was leaving his previous uh you know his previous um uh uh, management arrangement and decided to come um and um and join as well and so we really we went from there um and you know started again with a, with a much smaller roster in early 2012 and and just built it you know built it organically sort of bit by bit you know mistake by mistake mm. um onwards from you know from there um and you know it, it was um it, it was a it was a really really interesting time we had um and a lot of artists who, uh, you know, kind of came to us over over that period, and you know, we were in a position where we could, you know, build a team, and it really helped keeping things in Bristol, and you know, yeah. keep initially, you know, keeping things, you know, our kind of main office in Bristol, um, and yeah, over that time, you know, over you know, the following eight nine years, you know, built built great into the company that you know that it was. Uh, you know, Im- immediately pre pre COVID, um, and you know that was you know hugely rewarding. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was a really great time. How and, uh, how how important do you think community in a management company in as an artist as everything in dance music is? Do you mean community within the company, or do you mean community within the you know the artists' actual you know, ex- like fan community? I think as in the management side of things. Um, I mean, we were, we were, we were, you know, we were, we were a family, you know, it was a real kind of like, you know, family operation. My ran, my wife for a number of years until we had our second, second child, you know, ran the office, you know, did everyone's, you know, invoicing and, you know, holidays and, you know, all the internal HR. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was, you know, also being in Bristol, Bristol's a lot more, you know, we were in a very kind of community driven office space with, you know, which was very much, you know, it was quite kind of like, earthy and you know and generally bristol yeah um and i like that you know our offices are still in there now you know we've got you know i i, I like you know bristol's bristol has a, as a city has a great you know musical and artistic community mm. uh, a lot of people kind of supporting each other and you know really um uh you know really uh uh you know kind of looking out for each other and that's something that um you know that uh you know that we were kind of keen to build on internally as as, as far as the company is concerned as well. I think it's so key. I think if over the years, if you look at some of the best cruise companies, anything in this music industry, it's all revolved around a tight knit of community and family. Um, yeah. I there's something about it, and I remember f- f- at the early days of my career looking at at grade as a management company and all the artists seemed to just get on well with each other everyone supported each other yeah and there, was... yeah, there were very there were very few there were very few egos yeah. you know in our roster. And generally every that was one of the nice things you know was was you know everyone was kind of supporting everyone else it, in that respect you know the kind of the community aspect of of the it extended into the not just the artists that we were working with but also their tour managers mm. The record labels, yeah, you know, the um, you know, the the you know, and and then even the people kind of related, you know, related to that. So, um, you know, and it's been, you know, people like you, your man, your manager Ryan, yeah, you know, he was part of, you know, he was Seth's agent. Mm. That's how I know him. Um, and um, you know, so you know, building that wider network out, you know, Steve Hogan, you know, Seth and Yoris and Jack Master and um, um, and Groove Armada's agent you know who's also in, lives in bristol and you know has became a you know a close friend and was so pivotal in our kind of you know joint success yeah. you know working with his team at william morris and um you know and, and all of the other kind of agents that we work with it was you know it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful thing when it's when everyone's you know kind of singing from the same hymn sheet and and and, and things are harmonious totally um aspiring artist if somebody is listening right now and they're like, I know what I want to do in my, in my for my career. I know where I want to go. I know what I want to do. I know I don't, but I just don't know how to do it. How important is a manager for an artist like that? Um, I think if you don't, 
if you don't know the answers to how you're going to get successful, you need to keep thinking. And a manager is not going to answer those questions for you. Mm. You know, a lot of people see management or an agent as being the kind of like the the key that unlocks their kind of, you know, their, their wildest dreams. And that's not the case. Yeah. You know, I've said this in many panels, you know, you light the fire, the manager fans the flames, yeah. you know, and it's your job. You know, you can't be passive in that, in that, in that endeavor. You know, as an artist, you have to be the one that is knocking on doors, creating opportunities, creating music, creating magic, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and presenting yourself in a, in an authentic and engaging way to as many people as possible. Totally. All a manager is going to do is help you do that bigger and better, mm -hmm. but you have to be doing it already yourself. And you have to be thinking that you have to have that kind of like, you know, innovative, hungry, enthusiastic outlook for how you are going to engage with your current audience and potential fans. And that is hugely, hugely important. And, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's something that a lot of artists miss. They think that, you know, that, or if I get a manager, then, yeah. you know, if I get an agent, then I'll get loads more gigs. It's like, no, that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You need to go out and get yourself loads of gigs. You need to get yourself on the pro on the radar of promoters. You need to make tunes that resonate with fans that want to pay tickets to give you a value for promoters to book you. Yeah. yeah? And if you're not doing that, you're not going to get booked. And if you're not getting booked regularly, no agent is going to be interested in working with you. So you have to have gone and jumped through all of those hoops yourself and done and done all of that thinking, gone worked out how to, how to, you know, make promote make yourself appealing to promoters. Mm. The easiest way to do that is by writing music. Yeah. Because then people want to come and see you because you are known. Yeah. Other way of doing that is by being an exceptionally good DJ. There are also people who do it by just being really fucking nice and personable and just mm. being like good with people um and normally the best artists are a mixture of Everything. them those three facets and many many more yeah you know um and you can't you can't really fake that and a manager is certainly not going to be able to fake it on your part the half and you're going to be wasting your time in theirs if you do think that that's the case so you know if you are an if you're a an aspiring artist and you know you're you're wondering what's next you need to wonder a little harder because you it's you that needs to be defining what's next and then doing that over and over again to the point where a manager like myself goes, I can see that person, that, that girl or boy is doing a fantastic job of that mm. and I want to help them do it more and better. Yeah, I think that's probably the best advice ever um, because talking from experience in the past with past managers – realistically i didn't exactly know what i wanted i didn't didn't know that exact where i want to be and how i'm going to get there and i just expected and i think for me the turning point was when i knew exactly what i wanted to do and how to get there and just needed a hand to kind of take it to that next level yeah um, and you chose very well because you know and i've said yeah. any other artists who are listening here and now and, and as aspiring to you know to to success similar to the will do what it takes to get on the on the on the radar of, of someone like ryan his yeah. you know his manager because you know it, it's it's a classic you, i think you're a very good example of someone who would just you were at a certain point you've done everything that you could do physically yourself yeah. and you just needed a bit of an extra helping hand but then having someone like ryan who comes from such a rigorous background of being an agent at William Morris, which is like pretty much kind of like, you know, like Harvard Business School for, you know, the being best. ninja at, at, you know, all things yeah. music related. Um, you know, you were in pretty good hands. And um, you know, and so if you know it, it as a you know, as a young artist, you want to be aspiring to go and get on the radar on a manager like that. Not some guy you met down the pub who says, oh, I'll manage you and, you know, we'll, we'll make you famous. Well, you know, I or, yeah. I, I or the other option is, the other option, you either you either go and get on the radar of someone you really respect because they've done good stuff and they're doing good stuff for artists that you really like, or you go and work with your mate, your mate who knows you inside out, yeah. who wants to build his name as a manager and wants, and you do that as a kind of like organic, you know, quid pro quo, mm. you know, yin and yang type, you know, arrangement. Um Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It worked for me. It's kind of yeah. that's kind of yeah. what we did, um, uh, you know, from a, from the kind of you know the in the grassroots and, um, but uh, it's not 
always going to work. And unfortunately, there are times when you do need someone who's got quite a bit of kind of industry experience Clout to kind of propel as well. forward. I, I, yeah, but it's more just knowing what to do in a specific situation and knowing who to call. And yeah. totally, I think for me, the main thing that that is the main thing that I will ever look for in future for working with anyone in the industry, whether that's management, whether that's agents, whether that's anything is relationship um, between myself and them. Um, yeah. I, and I think with, with a, with a strong relationship because you, you, you have real honesty and with like Ryan, my manager, we can be brutally honest to each other and we can, we can really, kind of go no that's fucking not right or yes that's right blah 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 you should be doing this you should be doing that try this try that where well, i think there's a lot of a lot of people a lot of artists that don't have that relationship with their manager when their manager says something it they take it as an offense rather than a learning and i think that's that's where relationships break down and for me the the, the main thing for me was building a relationship before going into a management relationship with someone. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing I've learned from, from this whole game. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, you know, it's, uh, the whole of the music industry is based on relationships, based on, totally. you know, and on friendships and, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, all of that, you know, kind of commonality between like-minded people. And, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's one of the most important thing I advise I'd give to any young artist is to go out and meet people, mm. you know, don't, you know, if you want to get booked at fabric, don't fucking go pestering fabric with SoundCloud links, you know, go to the club. Yeah. Try and meet people. Yeah. You know, I've said this to like, I've said this to people, like, how do I get a job in the industry? It's like, go and meet people and mm. be visible and it's so refreshing when you do tell that to someone, the next time you see them, they're hanging out in the booth at Fabric. And they're not hanging out as a hanger on, they're hanging out because they're like they've been invited in there because yeah. they, they, they you know they you know, and the next thing you know, they've they've you know, they're popping up on the front desk at William Morris. It's how I mean exactly. I remember this one girl whose name I won't mention because she might be a little embarrassed, but I'm so proud of her. She was literally like I first met her because she wanted, I think she wanted me to send a do like a signed birthday card for Seth. Um, you know, like for for her or one of her mates, the history doesn't quite doesn't quite relate. But um, the next thing you know, she's like hitting me up. Can I sort out guest this for, you know, for warehouse project? Um, and you know, turning up on the you know and 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 kind of hanging out backstage. And the next thing I know, I'm walking work, walking into the William Morris Morris Ox, um, offices on Oxford Street, and she's there sitting on the front desk, like manning the phones. I'm like, what are you Love doing that. here? She's like, oh, I got a job. Love um, that. And um, they gave me a job. And she's now worked her way all the way up the company. And she's just made agent. And that yeah. for me is like, yes, go it's the on. the best thing. That's like amazing. Um, and, you know, so like rewarding to see people really kind of like following up like that. Totally. And it's, you know, she's an unbelievably nice person. And she is, um, you know, she's also very, very good at what she does. Yeah. And she's done it from the ground up, you know, um, you know, like like so many people i mean i remember ryan your manager telling me about you know driving in every single morning from fucking orange county yeah to you know to to the wme offices in in, to in, sort in the Hollywood post out, to sort it's post like fucking hour and a half or something in the car on like the fucking freeway you know to go and sort the mail and get shouted at yeah um you know but that's what you got to do you got you've got to kind of earn your stripes you know and if you're earning your stripes is paying shitty gigs in you know in in pubs with beer soaked carpets and you know mm. shitty cdjs that sticky because they've had red you know red bull spilt on them then that's what you've got to do um and you know rome was not built in a day and you have to just you know you have to in a lot of respects just pay your dues keep keep the faith keep doing what you're doing and do it you know with more you know now and innovation yeah. than, than the next girl or boy Totally. Um, I, I agree and I think that's the most perfect way to end this um, yeah that yeah. was that was that was amazing thank you dude yeah, yeah it's been, been, been my absolute pleasure how can um how can people get in touch with you how can people follow you I mean, if any young artists listening to this yeah send me an email I'm not going to tell you my email address you can work that out for yourself <laughs> um yeah um but um it's yeah it's it's uh it's 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 there are ways of finding me 
by all means find me um and i'd be happy to talk send me an email and i'm always available um but um yeah it's uh uh it'd be you know it, it's always a pleasure to chat to uh you know to people who are um you know who are hungry and and uh and you know excited about plotting their next steps and mm. you know for me it's one of the most pleasurable things i do actually is chatting with like young artists and you know um giving any kind of advice that i can because there's it, there's quite a lot that you know you can you can move the dial quite a lot when you've been doing this for you know i've not been doing this as long as some you know kind of titans of the you know, music industry yeah. um you know i'm still relatively you know making this up as i'm going along and i still i still think it's important to kind of have that mindset i do not have all the answers but i can very easily from a kind of creative thinking point of view and from a you know uh you know a sort of forward vision career vision career planning point of view it's quite easy to move the dial and also to say that you know to give encouragement where current and praise where praise is due but at the same time also you know to be to hold quite a sharp mirror up of, of relief up to you know to whatever you might be doing and and ask some some maybe tricky questions that you might have to go away and think about and you know and um but the answers to them you know will probably help you enormously um so yeah for anyone listening who would like a chat work out how to get in touch with me send me an email and i'd love to chat um and uh, thank you so much will for for uh, a really engaging conversation on a grey, gloomy, Bristolian <laughs> afternoon. Thanks for coming on, man. Um, I'm back mid-September to Lessa. Uh, go get some Jamaican food. And uh, when you when are you actually back? Uh, I think I don't. I haven't booked my flights, but from okay, well, do let me know. Yeah, and yeah, Jamaican's on me. Sweet, sounds good, man. Keep safe. Send my love to the family cool. and look Quick after yourself. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Take care, mate. And that is a wrap. Thanks to you, Ed, for coming on the show. It was a great podcast, great conversation. If you enjoyed it, please share it, hit subscribe. Don't forget to do all of that. Keep safe and I'll see you next time.